those of you who are new here, my name is Charles Small. I'm the director of the Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism, or ESA. And today, so thank you for coming. Today, uh, we're really happy and to have Professor David Manashri here. The title of this talk will be Iran, the Middle East, and the USA following the presidential elections, a view from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Manashri is uh, the director for the Center of Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University. He's also the Dean of uh, Overseas Students um, at Tel Aviv University. He's the Dean of the University Special Programs Division. He is the incumbent of the Parviz and Quran uh, Nazarene Chair for Modern Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv Universities at Tel Aviv University. And he's also the uh, professor at the Department of Middle East History and African Studies. And he's the chairman of the Makadion Foundation, which provides, does amazing work actually in Israel, helping to uh, fund uh, scholarships for Mizrahi or uh, Sephardic uh, Jewish students with deprived backgrounds uh, in Israel. They do amazing work. Uh, the Munashri has been here several times, he's a friend of Isa. He's on this trip and uh, another trip, he's traveled all over the world speaking about Iran. Um, he was a Fulbright scholar at Princeton and at Cornell. Uh, University of, he's taught at the University of Chicago, the University of Melbourne, the University of Munich, and Waseda in Tokyo. Uh, he's the chairperson of the International Sephardic Educational Fund and the president of the Citizens Empowerment Center in Israel, trying to bring about reform to the Israeli uh, electoral system. Um, he was given Ford Foundation funding, Fulbright Foundation funding, and also Ben Gurion Foundation funding on, on many projects. He's widely published uh, academic books and articles and journals and uh, newspapers. So he's really, I think, the leading expert on Iranian issues uh, in the world and certainly from Israel. And I think the title of the talk today, from our perspective, um, I would argue that the view from Jerusalem and the views from the Middle East and from the region are really important to, to understand. And I think we seem to have uh, placed ourselves in a bubble, uh, perhaps at Yale and perhaps even in Washington, <coughs> regarding the, the threats and the issues that are really at stake, not only for, for Israel and demonization and what I call the genocidal anti-Semitism of the regime vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel, but also in terms of human rights, the subjugation of women, of gay people, of the Baha'is, and other religious uh, minorities in Iran, the sort of differentiating of citizenship, the threat uh, of destabilizing the Middle East, the threat to Sunnis, uh, countries, the list goes on. I know David will give us a perspective from Jerusalem and, uh, and the view of Jerusalem into the, this whole situation at a very important moment. So, thank you for being here. Uh, 
interaction to have views from different aspects that they are, they are, they are from different angles and different perspectives on this rather significant issue that often enough has also some political connotation. And I'm not a politician, I've never been, probably I've never been. Uh, no, I've never been, not probably. I've never been a politician, so uh, I speak on, uh, from my studies about the Middle East and Iran. Uh, and here is a difficulty that any scholar of discussing Iran will have while speaking in such a distinguished group of people at Yale on, on the topic. And many years back, when I was asked to speak about Iran, I didn't know where to start because really people didn't know almost anything about Iran. Today, when I'm coming to speak about Iran, it's another difficulty. Where should I start when everyone is an expert on Iran? You open your newspapers every day and you read about Iran. So I want to give permission to, to take one step back from the current immediate developments and try and put the Iranian Islamic Revolution and the developments there in what I would uh, believe is a more proper uh, framework, the general framework of the developments in Iran and the Middle East. The Iranians have marked a uh, few months ago <coughs> 30 years to the Islamic Revolution. And I think they have done it with a deep soul searching process. With the main question in the air being, is what we got 30 years after is what our parents or ourselves were aiming at in 1979 when we joined Ayatollah Khomeini to topple the Shah and establish the Islamic Republic of Iran. I think that if you ask yourself also what is behind the students of young people riots in Iran following the presidential Iranian elections, this is the same question. What did we achieve from this revolution? To what degree did the results of the revolution so far conform with the aims of the people who sacrificed so much in participating in a magnificent movement to overthrow a powerful Shah and establish the first Islamic Republic in the Middle East, the modern Middle East. But I think if you ask this question of young people in Iran, not even not young people in Iran, it's very likely that the answer will be no, our expectations were much higher than what we expect when we see today. The Iranian people, more than any other people in the Middle East, they have fought in the last hundred years to achieve two main goals. That I can very briefly tell them the, the struggle for bread and freedom, welfare and liberties. 30 years after the Islamic Revolution, this has not been yet achieved. The degree of disillusionment, disenchantment that you see in the Iranian streets go back to this frustration from the results of the revolution that do not conform with what the revolution was to be in the beginning. So if you look at the goals of the revolution, uh, the Iranian Islamic revolution, like any other revolution in history or any other political change in history, they have two main aims in mind. First, when you take over, your main aim as a political system is to maintain in power. And I think this uh, the standard revolution has been so far fairly successful. 30 years after, we have the same Islamic regime in place. Uh, I don't know what will happen tomorrow, but so far it is fairly stable and in control of our instruments of power. But revolutions do not enter into our life simply to replace one government with another. Often enough, they come to prove that they have different ideology and that different ideology is the best cure to the problems of society. The Islamic Revolution certainly was an ideological movement with the slogan, Islam is the solution, trying to prove that joining the caravan of Islam will bring you to salvation, bring you to, your, to the promised land. <coughs> So if 30 years after the revolution, I think politically speaking, the regime is still in place, but the aims of the revolution has no, have not been yet uh, met in any significant way. And before going on, I want very briefly to put in your table the three questions that I usually start with them when I discuss about Iranian revolution. Uh, first question is to what degree this revolution is Islamic in its roots. 
And here I must admit that if you use Western terminology that distinguishes between religion and state, religion and science, religion and so many different things, the Islamic revolution was not really religious. It was social, economic, political, cultural, anti-imperialist. In the world of Islam, like in Judaism, they, these are all part and parcel of your religious belief system. <coughs> in the Middle East, Jews or Muslims, there is no distinction between religion and state. Everything is religious or has to do with religion. Even what we eat is being defined by religion. A social structure, political system. So if you use Western terminology, the revolution was much wider than pure religious revolution in the narrow Western meanings of the term. It was, however, religious in Middle Eastern terminology. What I'm trying to say here is that the people who joined Ayatollah Khomeini did not join merely to replace one government with another. They didn't join Ayatollah Khomeini with the hope of bringing the Islamic regime. They brought Ayatollah Khomeini because life was miserable and people were looking to hope to improve the life of themselves and at least achieve their children. I put it differently and I often say, uh, not that I'm proud to say this, but as the way I recognize myself, I lived in the last in the last two years of the Shah's rule in Tehran, doing study uh, in support of the Fourth Foundation in Tehran University. Had I been Iranian citizen, I might have joined Ayatollah Khomeini, and not because of religion and not because of Islam, because life was so bad. And Khomeini provided the hope that the future will be brighter. If this analysis is true. This final stabilization of the Islamic regime does not have to do with a degree of return to Islam, but rather to a degree that the problems that <coughs> motivated people to join the Ayatollah Khomeini in 79 have been elevated or at least significantly eased. 30 years after, this did not happen. And what did happen is that the revolution, which was so initially social, political, cultural movement, turned to be an Islamic revolution. It's an Islamic revolution in its results rather than in the aims, if you use Western terminology. I hope I made this point clear. And I want to move to another question, to what degree the philosophy of this regime conforms with Islamic philosophy. Well, here is the question, what is Islamic philosophy? Is there one thing that you can say, this is the Islamic philosophy? This is the philosophy, is Islamic ideology. <coughs> well, of course there is one. There is one Judaism, one Christianity, and one Islam. But we don't live today exactly according to what Judaism used to be 3,000 years ago, or Christians today do not live according to what Christianity used to be 2,000 years ago. And Islam today is not exactly what the Prophet Muhammad brought to, uh, to this world in the 7th century. We live today by our interpretation of the principles of faith. And in each generation, different locations, there are different interpretations <coughs> that can be regarded as valid and appropriate. When Khomeini came to power in 1979, there have been seven grand Islamic authorities, grand Ayatollahs in Iran. None of them supported Ayatollah Khomeini. The highest ranking Ayatollah in Iran at that time, most learned and much more respected academically speaking, religiously speaking, in terms of his uh, religious standing, was Ayatollah Shariat Madari, who was forced under house arrest and he, until he passed away seven years later. The most leading Ayatollah, well, maybe not the most leading Ayatollah, but the man that Ayatollah Khomeini picked up to be his successor after his death, Ayatollah Muntazari, a leading Iranian Ayatollah, does not have the right today to speak to his students. And there are here people here from the Human Rights Recommendation Center, and they can tell you more information about so many people who are, don't have the freedom to speak, even if they are prominent scholars. Not to, speak, not to speak about professors at universities. What we saw in Iran, therefore, is a revolution in understanding Islam, even more than an Islamic revolution in terms of ideology. And here I usually 
<coughs> like to quote a Iranian thinker who was one of the leading figures in the Cultural Revolution in Iran, who was the head of the Cultural Revolution movement in Iran after the Islamic Revolution success, Abdul Karim Saroush, who said a sentence that I think contains all what I want to say in one in a few words. He said, there is no one interpretation of Islam. There is no one interpretation that is better than the other, and there is no final <coughs> interpretation of Islam. And in a very courageous way, he added, and there can be no official interpretation of Islam. Namely, even an Islamic <coughs> regime cannot come and tell you, this is the sole way to understand the principles of faith. faith. Because I happen to think so. That's not Islam. <coughs> there, are, there is a degree of pluralism in religious thinking. Khomeini's philosophy represented one extremist trend in the world of Islam, that he brought them to the center in case of Iran to power, influencing movements like Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, FIS, and other movements in the story, in, in the Middle East. And the third question that brings us closer to our topic of current developments is, to what degree the policy of the Islamic regime conforms with the uh, ideology of Ayatollah Khomeini of 30 years ago. And here again, like any other Islamic <coughs> revolution in history, look at the French Revolution, Chinese Revolution, Russian Revolution, whatever. Look at any government who takes over. There is a huge difference between what leaders say before taking power and what they do after taking power. Well, it's not criticism of anybody. It's natural. <laughs> and that's the way it should be. When you are in opposition, you express your worldview. You say what you want to do. There is no tax on promises of election campaign. Then, somehow it happens that you are elected. And then you can only do what you can do. Certainly, it's not what you promise. We had a prime minister in Israel, Arik Sharon, who immediately after being elect, uh, elected, he started, he initiated unilateral withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, totally unlike his pledges during the election campaign. And he was challenged at this point. He said, uh, for the Senate, they say, what you see from here, from the chair of the prime minister, you don't see <coughs> from there, from the benches of the opposition. Well, so if you are a candidate, you say what you want to say. Then you can be planned in prime minister <coughs> totally different. That's the same thing happened to the Iranian revolution. I know you're thinking about other administrations. It happens other as well. <laughs> but it's not, it is not typical to the Iranian revolution, but it's also Islamic revolution. I'll make it in very concise, saying that wherever there was a clash between ideology and the interest of the running system or existing system, the interest of this ex uh, the ruling system or of Iran, of the interest of Iran as being viewed by the ruling system, war over ideology. We don't have much time to go into details. I've done it uh, last previous time I've been here and I don't want to go to, into examples, but take my word. I'll give you maybe one sentence. One fatwa, one religious decree that was published by Ayatollah Khomeini, the founding father of the Islamic Revolution, when he was asked about this gap between ideology and interest, he issued a religious decree stating that if for the sake of the public interest, for the sake of maslaha, public interest, interest of the people, an Islamic regime is entitled to destroy a mosque and suspend the five basic principles of Islam. What else do you need? to legitimize uh, preference of interest over, over ideology. Now, on what issues to compromise, in what ways to adopt pragmatic policies, on these there are differences of opinion between different factions in Iran. And there are many factions, many trends within the Iranian uh, political system, but let me just refer to two main caps or threats or waves. The one that we usually call reformist, pragmatic, liberal if you want, moderate if you wish, on the one hand, and the more radical, extremist, conservative trend on the other side. Of course, each of them has different uh, sub-groupings in, in, in the camps. 
Let me say a word about the more pragmatic element. Well, I think that the Islamic Revolution has produced, after 30 years, a magnificent young generation of people, students, girls, boys, whom you could see in the streets of Tehran recently, that are struggling for freedom more than we see them in other parts of the Middle East. Iran is the, be the most active student organizations in the Middle East, <coughs> the best, in my view, cinema industry, the most active human organizations. Uh, they have the newspapers in Iran are interesting to read until they are being shut down by the government. <laughs> Uh, intellectuals write books that are amazing for me to see them being published in Iran. Not really as <coughs> Ahmadinejad, but before Ahmadinejad. Uh, so, and I, so, just imagine that Iran has now six, almost 60% of the student body is composed of women. 60 years ago, there was, a, a, there was not a single girl studying in any Iranian university. So I think that whoever looks for the, the future, <coughs> if a nation that has a wonderful young boys and girls and students and women that the Iranians have, they have a bright future. The problem is not with the people. The, the problem is with the running, with the, with the government in power. So, so it go out of this, uh, and I, I spoke about newspapers, and I spoke few years ago in Tel Aviv uh, in about the uh, relative freedom of expression in Iran. And if, uh, one of our officials told me how you can speak about even relative freedom of expression when 100 newspapers were shut down in the last five years, between 2000 and 2005. 100 liberal newspapers were shut down. And my answer was showing other countries in the Middle East, which is 100 liberal newspapers to shut them down. We <laughs> <laughs> shut down 100 liberal newspapers. But still, for my, I look, I look at the half full of the class right now. That is half full of the class. And you speak about intellectuals being, being in jail. Yeah, but you don't. I give you a title of a book published in Iran by Akbar Ganji. He's now in the United States. He was jailed after the publication of the book. And you hear the title of the book. You will have jailed him yourself. The book, the title is A Fascist Interpretation of Islam. And the book in, the, in blue claims that the Iranian government is fascist. Well, of course, you can't publish such a book in Tehran and be free the day after. <laughs> and, uh, and, and when I spoke about an Iranian friend of mine, a professor of one of the universities of this rather dichotomy between free expression and suppression, he told me, you know, they tell you there is no freedom of expression in Iran. That's not true. We have freedom of expression. What we don't have is freedom after expression. It's <laughs> 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 very, very, it's deeper than it sounds. They go, they struggle, and I admire this civil society of Iran. But my problem is they don't have any say in formulating Iranian policy on any meaningful thing on the top of the national security issues. So our problem is not with, my problem is not with civil society. My problem is that this civil society and the reform movement, they don't have much influence in how to run the state. Full power is still in the hand of the more radical, extremist, conservative groups, and led by Khamenei, Ahmadinejad, Mesbah Yazdi, and I don't want to confuse you with father names, which they have four elements in power. <coughs> First, the speaking name of God. In the Middle East, it's so great that you wake up in the morning and you know exactly what is the will of God. <laughs> and you share it with the people and say, well, that's the way you should behave because that's what God wants. I don't know if they Skype or whatever contact with, with heaven every day and they know exactly. Well, it's not only in Islam. It's also we have among our Jewish leaders some people who think that they know exactly what God wants. <clears throat> it's very difficult in the Middle East to, to, to fight with the will of God as being expressed by the people who are supposed to know what is the will of God. And thanks God, we have so many people who know what God really wants. Now, if God's not enough, God forbid, because it should be enough. 
just in war, just in case he's not, he's not a god, they have the revolutionary cards. Now, if you're a revolution, you have the will of God on one side, <coughs> the army and the revolutionary guard on the other side, you are safe. What else you, you need? Well, there's one other thing that it's good to have, is the will to fight for, your, for, me, for keeping your power in hand. And the clerics in Iran did not take power 30 years ago to concede it voluntarily. They learned the lesson of their own revolution. And there was a student's uprising and rioting in the streets of Tehran. One thing they say was for me very impressive. Say, we are not going to let them to do to us what we did to the Shah 30 years ago. Huh. They certainly learned the lesson of their own revolution. And I quote you just one <laughs> sentence from the word, the man who is being, who is believed to be the method <coughs> of the Dimitri that is saying in a Friday sermon, <coughs> whoever thinks that Islam is religion of mercy does not understand what is Islam. Islam is a religion that dictates to us to take sharp sword and cut the heads and tongues of people who act or speak against us. And this is the mentor of, of Ahmadinejad. God forbid Islam is a religion of mercy. But there are such people like Ms. Yasti who would even claim that Islam is not religion of mercy. They start their, their every step and say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of merciful God. But then can you say that Islam is not religion of mercy? But it was said by including Ayatullah, mentor of Ahmadinejad, one of the most powerful men in Iran today. The other advantage that they have is that uh, there is no opposition. Well, of course, there, there, there are oppositions. And they hate each other more than they hate the regime in Tehran. In the early days of the revolution, I, was, I spent much of my time speaking with the leaders of different factions of the Iranian revolution, mainly in Paris, which are uh, situated. And it was amazing. You know, speaking with Bakhtiar, rather than telling you what is wrong with the regime in Tehran, he was speaking against Bani Sadr. Bani Sadr was speaking against Amini, Amini against someone else. To the point that I thought that these people had been all corrupted by French culture. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, in positive meaning of the world, they think that they are Jacques Marc, <coughs> Napoleon Bonaparte, or Charles de Gaulle, that single handedly will save the nation. <coughs> I can promise you one thing the next leader of Iran will not come to Iran with air France like Khomeini did. <laughs> they will come from inside the country. And, and, and so this, <coughs> this movement, and I see them in Los Angeles now, in Great Neck, in Kings Point, and all over and, uh, London and Paris, they're still you know, criticizing, but this is not the hope for changing Iran, and I think if they come to it later, the hope is from inside Iran. Now, what was the led this young people in Iran to the streets after the elections? And I don't want to go into this election. It's very difficult even for me to call this June 12th elections, elections. But I think that they represent a significant disillusionment of the children of the revolution from the result of this movement of the As I said earlier, these two uh, aims of the movement, welfare and freedom, have not been achieved. There is no greater welfare for the poor people of Iran today that used to be under the shock. And there is no greater freedom for the people of Iran today, or not significantly much freedom today than it used to be before. Under the Shah, and I lived in Iran the last two years of the Shah's rule, and I must tell you, I learned to appreciate democracy, living in a non-democratic system for the first time in my life. Only people who practice and live under a non-democratic system can understand what is the value of democracy. And I hope that the young people sitting here would not take democracy as for, for granted, because it's the most important thing that we have in our life. But under the Shah, to speak against the Shah was crime. Today, to speak against the ruling system is a sin, and I don't know which one of them is better. <laughs> Certainly, today is not much better than it used to be before the revolution. It was, in a way, also, this movement, a reaction to the change in the elections of last November in, in, in America. President Obama brought, uh, uh, he brought with him a promise to the underprivileged 
and people in the non-democratic system that they have a friend in Washington. Now, let me put it bluntly. Wherever there is a Democrat president in the White House, you can rest assured there's going to be a revolution in Iran. <laughs> and I'm not against it, God forbid. On the talk of, I was quoted in, I, I was in November 4, 2008, and quoted one of the newspaper to say that his election in America was one of the most happiest days in my life. And I really enjoyed this to see the young people in the streets, joyful, and, and these winds of change coming. Because I'm not, uh, and you see my views about dialogue, I'm not against the, the concept of dialogue. But I'll tell you what's my concept of dialogue, which is different from what's in, in Washington today. But history of relations between Iran and the United States is very brief. The America is in the Middle East only since the Second World War II, basically. I don't, I discount, I don't speak about missionary <coughs> groups who have been in the 19th century. Politically, America is in the Middle East after the withdrawal of Britain after World War II. Now, in 51, those of you who remember, Mossadegh in Iran, the Prime Minister, who led to the uh, exile of the Shah with the, the raising this, this uh, philosophy of nationalization of oil. He led this movement to success. In 1951, you remember who was the president of the White House? It's Harry Truman. 61, 62, Khomeini became a national hero in Iran, opposing the Shah's policies and his white revolution. The president is JFK. 78, 79, Islamic Revolution. Then you have Carter in the White House. And now you have Obama, which he came with a promise, and people viewed not because Democrat president wants to lead to revolution in other places. Because they put human rights so high on their <coughs> agenda. And if you live in Iran and say, wow, now we have a president that we can go and struggle against our government to achieve freedoms with the backing of, of the president of the United States. This Democrat system has given, and this is to, to convince that I think positively when I say that they have given support to these winds of change in movements in the Middle East, certainly in Iran, and especially with President Obama. The way he came out of where he came from to achieve power was very impressive. His slogan, yes we can, came from, what? Well, encourage many people. Now, this slogan is not Obama's slogan. Yeah, I remember 2005, the slogan of Ahmadinejad in his first election campaign was, yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> then I was told that it's a Chavez election in 2004. So that's not new, but it's, it's very, it captivated the minds of the people of America. And that's what counts. That's a matter of where you broke it from. It doesn't have to give footnotes. Yes, we can, as was mentioned initially by Chavez. <laughs> Our university, I would love to do it in politics. So, uh, so, and the way of, you know the meaning of the word Obama in Persian? The way it's written, it means he with us. And the students were going to Obama, he is with us. And then later on they said, Obama is his he is not with us. And last November 4, when students were in the streets, one of the very attractive slogans was Obama, 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 and Ha, Obama, Obama, Obama. You are with them, with the government of Iran, or with us. And it sounds beautiful in Persian. Obama, 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 and Ha, Obama. So Obama is also named and also he with us. Are you with us or are you with them? After coming to power, basically, these winds of change were translated into the will to, to move things forward. Unfortunately when they, for them, when they started their struggle, the President of the United States, well, maybe closed his eyes, the eyes certainly closed his mouth, and he didn't speak about this movement. And were very disappointed from the perspective of Iranian students. Not that, not, not that President Obama was faced with an easy choice, because here is the White House President of America. In 1953, Americans interfered with Iran and turned to be very bad. In 1978, America did not interfere in America and was also turned to be not good. 
So what does Shakespeare say? To be or not to be? That's the question <laughs> that was faced with the American president. But the fact remains that students in Iran were very disappointed that the administration did not say something general in favor of human rights at that very sensitive days. What is movement wants? I, I think that the movement wants to change realities of life, to go back to the hopes of 79, and to make sure that Iran is more democratic and provides opportunity for the underprivileged. I think the realities today make Iran of 90s, end of 1970, 19, 2009, significantly different from before this the revolution of June. This regime has lost to a great degree its legitimacy. A regime that was based itself on morality, religiosity, and values is now based primarily on the arms of force. Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, did not behave like Khomeini, his predecessor, that always took care to be above the factions and remain the supreme leader of the entire nation, Khamenei took side with one faction against the other. And then the students go to the streets and chant debt to dictatorship. I don't think they only mean the government of Ahmadinejad, but they have the supreme leader in mind. I remember when the Islamic Revolution <coughs> uh, in 1978, 8 of 78, the Shah wanted to appease the, the opposition. And he replaced the government and appointed one of the oppositionary leaders, Bakhtiar, to prime minister. This, uh, the demonstrators went to the streets and said, we asked, we asked to change the horse. They changed the saddle. Ahmadinejad is not the main issue. Ahmadinejad is only an instrument. And I think when they want to, when they want to change the system, they want to change the system at large. <coughs> The limitation of this power, of their power, is that, well, for one thing, I don't, I don't believe that Musavi seems to be the charismatic leader who will bring the change in Iran. Uh, he doesn't have the charisma, but he doesn't have the alternative or doesn't carry the alternative cohesive ideology to control this uh, current system. To lead the revolution to success, you need to bring people to <coughs> unify behind a slogan or a concept that all agree. It was easy for Khomeini because his, his slogans were very easy to sell and they're very absolute. He said, the Shah must go. Huh? You understand this language. <laughs> Islam is the solution, it's clear. And what is Musavi said? We want to change 30% of the political structure, 40% of the economic system. You cannot lead people to mass movement with a, the aim, which is to a degree. 30, 40% doesn't work. Now, I did have not been a revolutionary in my life, and I'm not here to teach you how to, to go to revolution. But people who want to go to revolution must know that you cannot go to slogan which is only gradual. Musavi is part of the system. He doesn't want to change the system. He wants to modify the system. And you cannot bring millions of people behind you to a change of a degree. You cannot even bring a revolution to success only with calls death to dictatorship, only for the call for political change. You need to bring the economic factor into it and promise people something in their daily life, the betterment of their daily life. What is great still time for chance? Yeah. The time is very brief. What is my, in my view, the problem that I see with Iran, the challenge of Iran? The problem is not with the people, as I said. It's not even with the government. <laughs> the problem that I see is that a combination of a radical regime like the Iranian regime is and a weapon of mass destruction. We can tolerate countries going nuclear, we can tolerate radical movements, but the combination of the two, a radical movement that holds, on the other hand, weapons of mass destruction, this is something that the world, I believe, cannot tolerate. And people say that as far as Israel, and this is the view from Jerusalem, from Tel Aviv, Israel doesn't have the, uh, Iran is far away and 
Well, Iran is not far away. Enemy. Iran is all over the borders of Israel. It's in Lebanon with the Hezbollah. It's in Gaza Strip with the Hamas. It is in the West Bank with the Islamic Jihad. And probably also within the Arab, some elements of the Arab citizens of Israel. Now imagine that Iran goes nuclear. The following day, Egypt, Turkey, uh, Syria, Saudi Arabia would also like to have nuclear weapon. And then what? This, this region, which is a bad house without nuclear weapon, how it would look? Which edge of this country is going nuclear? This regime also returned to Islamization of the Islam Arab-Israeli conflict. And start the problem facing Israel. And also facing the, the regimes in the more moderate Arab states, like Saudi Arabia, or Egypt, or Jordan. So what, and finally, what can be done? And I'll be trying to be very brief, let's say, for one thing, and I said it so many times, I don't think that the Iranian nuclear program should have a solution with a trademark made in Israel. That's not exclusively the problem of Israel. And I don't think that Israel is the big power who can s tackle this Iranian nuclear program. The problem of the is the problem of the world, and the solution would be provided by the world. It's too big a top, uh, task for Israelis. But I will here clean mention as a one sentence that was mentioned by a good friend of mine, former chief of staff of Israel, Dan Khalutz. He said, the problem of Iranian nuclear program is the problem of the world until we in Israel realize that the world is not doing what it's supposed to do. I have urged Israeli politicians to be more quiet on the issue of Iran nuclear program. <coughs> Otherwise, it will give the impression as though Israel is willing, is capable to deal with it. But on the other hand, if Israel is quiet, the world will tend to forget. And here's the dilemma of Israel. If we don't speak up, uh, the world would love to be quiet. In the meantime, I must tell you one thing. The Iranian nuclear scientists go to war every day. Even the days that the students were rioting in Tehran, they continue to go to work every day. And the clock of the Iranian nuclear program is ticking. So what is the solution? One is American-led solution. An American-led solution can be done with dialogue and pressure. I am not against dialogue as one of the few Israelis who advocated American-Iranian dialogue years back, to the point that uh, my views were very much unacceptable by the government of Israel. It was a taboo to speak about dialogue in Israel. But the dialogue that I had in mind was a real dialogue, not what's going on today. I must admit, we are even looking in the, uh, the dictionary, what is the meaning of the word dialogue? I don't, dialogue, unlike monologue, is, is two people speaking. I know that it's two and more. I was thinking dialogue as two people speaking. Americans sitting with the Iranians to solve their problems. That was my concept of dialogue. Otherwise, what is the difference between President Obama and President Bush? This five plus one did exist under President Bush. Dialogue, in my view, was that American and Iranians sit together and discuss. And this was, in my view, important for America, to have the Iranians sit with them. Iranians understood what is the challenge of this dialogue. They said that there is a policy of carrot and stick, and the carrot is poison. Yes, this carrot was poison for them. To sit with the Americans around the table with the flag of the United States and Iran, and my advice to the Americans would have been bombard Iran with chocolate, with candies, with good, good uh, gestures. Give them a few months, six months, a year, to come out with some accepted formula. If they will accept, wonderful. If they won't, as I believe they won't. Because the Iranians, it's very difficult for them, I don't want to say beyond it, to say yes or no. In Iranian diplomatic vocabulary, the word yes and no are totally unused. Their answers are often range from no, however, to yes, but. <laughs> and I know, and I knew in advance, that after months of negotiation, the Iranians will say yes, but. They don't say no, however. And then you go back to the first place. And that's exactly what the Iranians are doing. 
and they are gaining more and more time. After the 1967 war, <coughs> Hassanin Haikal, a close associate of President Nasser of Egypt, said that while the Arabs were playing badminton, the Israelis were playing chess. And I think today the world is playing badminton while the Iranians are playing chess. It should have been the other way around. Our policy towards Iran is not sophisticated enough. We trust God, we throw the dice and pray for good, good, good uh, luck. And the Iranians are more sophisticated. And I think we should learn from them to be more sophisticated, cunning, and shrewd in conducting policy. There is nothing wrong with that. <coughs> if there is a deadline, and we know when it ends, and provided that we know that at the end of dialogue, we have a yes or no answer for the Iranians. So far, this has not been the case. So there is also an alternative, an option for pressure. Iran is vulnerable to pressure. Iran cares what the world thinks about them. And here I can advise what the Shirin Evadi, the woman who won the Nobel Prize for Peace, called the European countries from Tehran. Downgrade your diplomatic relationship with Iran from ambassadorship to Shalshed Yafdar. And this is an Iranian woman speaking from Iran. She knows what hurts the guy and government. I have not heard about any European country or other who has done so. You can pressure Iran on moral issues, on human rights issues. The most important point, I think, that should be raised in front of the Iranians is human rights. Where is the world? Why is the world so silent on violations of human rights when it comes to Iran? I know that Israel is being criticized often. We deserve part of the of the criticism. Go ahead and do it. Pressure is there. But don't forget that uh, uh, violations of human rights are being done in so many other places. So why exclusively only one country should be blamed for this kind of issues? And I said, be my guest. Criticize Israel. You are maybe right. But don't, not only Israel, because I don't think it would be right to think that all the countries of the world are white and there is one thing which is black. And in the case of Iran, the issue of human rights is screaming to the skies. But each country is after its own selfish interest. There is economic pressure that can be used against Iran. Fine. There are many things that you can do to punish the government without punishing the people. Let the smart people of the world sleep. And God forbid, you don't want to punish the people. The second level of solution is Middle Eastern-made solution. I said there is no Israeli solution, but there is a Middle Eastern-made solution. And I've been very blunt on this issue. Israel and the most moderate Muslim, Muslim Arab countries should should take each other's hand and solve the problems of Israel and the Palestinians, Israel and Syria. If there will be peace between Israel and the Palestinians, I don't see how Iran can say to death to Israel and killing Israelis when, or wiping out Israel from the map if Israel and the Palestinians would live in peace. I know that you in Americans say that it takes two for tango. In this issue, there is not even one. So unfortunately, right now, uh, it's not in the cards. But I think that ultimately, if you want to weaken <coughs> Iran and also do a good service to Israelis and Arabs, let's together solve the Palestinian problem, solve together the Arab-Israeli conflict. And third, and with this I will end, the third set of solution is that homemade solution. The Iranian people who brought this regime to power would bring a change. Uh, and change the government or change the policy. <coughs> Unfortunately, I can see the two trains which have left the terminal in Iran, two trains in Iranian society. One is the nuclearization of Iran, and the other is the train with social change message. Unfortunately, the, the train with nuclear weapon is driving much faster than the train with social change. Social change is usually uh, it usually slow and always unpredictable. We don't know how the Russian Revolution came, or the French Revolution, or even the Iranian Revolution, or even the fall of the Soviet Union, which was not a mass movement. 
mass movement, or those of you who are students of history know that they are totally unpredictable. One day, yes, they will march and start moving. But what makes people to do to change? I know that ultimately when this happens, we'll have many experts in the world who will say, yes, I knew exactly what will happen. <laughs> Don't believe that no one really knows. <laughs> but what we know right now is that as, as much as we can tell, the process of nuclearization goes on. There are significant change in society, but the train, the train with nuclear is driving, in my view, much faster. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. So we have, we have about uh, 25 minutes for Q&A. Uh, and I'm going to start off with just, I was just on the internet now, as uh, we were speaking, as I usually am. And uh, within the last uh, less than an hour, the uh, IAEA came out with a report on the recent uh, inquiries and trips to, uh, to Iran to come and uh, to look at their nuclear facility. And in the report they said just now that there's many unanswered questions and that they want more answers. And that they've said now for the first time the, AA, the IAEA, for the first time they said that there's other secret sites uh, in Iran that they want to go to. Um, so in light of the update, uh, I know Renee is here, I know she must have some questions as well from the UN uh, Documentation Center. Can you comment on the Obama strategy of, uh, you, you spoke about the carrots and sticks and the five plus one. It seems to me that the Obama administration um, is entering into dialogue, but they've sort of separated the nuclear issue from the human rights issue. And uh, I think that speaks uh, in terms of the policy uh, funding of groups within and without, uh, outside of Iran and within the United States. And um, to me, the implications are disturbing. That I don't, by separating these two issues, even if the nuclear issue were somehow settled, which it doesn't seem that it's going to be, if it is settled and the human rights issue is sort of taken away from this, it would empower the regime to continue to abuse their own citizens. So, how, how do you, in light of the human rights issue, how do you see the negotiations over nuclear questions by the Obama administration? Are they taking an appropriate attack? Are they dealing with the issues that need to be addressed? So uh, if we wait until uh, human rights issues will be resolved to start negotiations, it's like Israelis will <coughs> wait until Muslim and Arab countries are democratic before we start negotiations. We will not start negotiations ever. So I don't think we can have to wait until Iranian, new, uh, Iranian human rights record will be 100% white before we start negotiation. Uh, negotiation means one of the aims is to resolve such problems as well. And to be honest with you, when I thought about dialogue with Iran before the recent developments, it never occurred to me the dialogue that is meant by America is the five plus one. I always thought in terms of bilateral dialogue. And there was a lot to Iran to gain and a lot for America to gain. And I think that one of the disturbing things among between Iran and the United States is that the relations are controlled or guided by so much by emotion rather than rationality. The two countries have so much in common. <coughs> And that Iran should be very thankful to America, you know, the country that has done the greatest services to Iran national interest in the last 20 years is the United States of America. America removed the enemy number one of Iran, Saddam Hussein, from their western borders. America removed the enemy number two of Iran, the Taliban in Afghanistan. But they have their own peculiar way to thank America for such great services. <coughs> it means also that there is some common ground and common interest between the two, the two countries. America has never taken any inch of Iranian territory. It's never threatened the sovereignty of <coughs> other countries <coughs> around it did. So there are, I think, base, there is basis for a better relationship between the two. The problem is for the Islamic revolution in Iran which has withdrawn so many principles on the ideological agenda. To accept the America, America is 
uh, almost an admission of a total failure of the Islamic revolution. And that's why I was so eager to see Diana. To have the Iranians sit with the Americans will change the nature of this regime. They cannot be the same regime as before if they sit with the Americans. About the Obama administration, the only thing I can say as someone who wants to come back again and again to America uh, is, uh, no, I know it's, it's just kidding. In your country, it's, it's a free country. As I said before, America, America, I am totally in favor of dialogue with Iran. I am totally in favor of any concession that the administration would like to do to the Iranians, provided that they will stop the nuclear program and respect human rights. That's with the only button lies that I have. As it seems today is that America is so eager to have <coughs> some kind of engagement with Iran that he forgets from time to time to ask for some preconditions. For example, I would have insisted after the June uh, uh, problems in Tehran that dialogue would be bilateral. Unfortunately, I don't know why America did not ask for bilateral uh, uh, and, uh, I just want to make, make a comment and I really have a question. Just a comment would be in terms of human rights. It's amazing that the regime just appointed the new defense minister who has an Interpol warrant for uh, bombing in the Jewish community center in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And now it seems that Yemen is very open. That the regime is supporting uh, civil war in Yemen very openly and actually warning the West not to intervene. So they're very, they're very emboldened. It's pretty amazing. And Obama's not responding, which I find interesting. Okay. I, I, I wanted to pick up just a little bit. Um, Excuse me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, why? You, so you mentioned that. Um, that the world that the world is not holding the Iranian regime accountable for human rights, and you mentioned that it's in self-interest. Can you expand on that a little bit? Why why is it that the world doesn't hold Iran accountable? Well, you know you know the answers better than I do. I can. Well, no. I think I think that uh, the world is composed with uh, particular nation states with uh, each of them its own uh, national interest. They, I don't think the question is being asked what we can do together, but what is the <coughs> impact of such an act on each of us in particular. For example, Germany, Italy, France. I, I can accept statements that are made by uh, Angela Merkel are very good. But then you look at the volume of trade between the two countries, they go to the sky. <coughs> so if I'm Iranian, I say, OK, they speak up, but they certainly certain don't punish us. I'll give you an example of a more uh, uh, effective European uh, policy. It goes back to the question uh, issued with Charles Smith about the, the defense minister of Iran, his, his views and past record. In, 19, in April 1997, a court in Berlin found Iranian leaders guilty in involvement in acts of terrorism in Germany. The case of Mykonos trial, a Kurdish leader was killed in Thestoran in, in Berlin. All European, all EU countries returned their ambassadors from Tehran. This was a big punishment for the Iranians. I don't think it's coincidental that a month later, the Iranians voted for Khatami, a moderate, pragmatic candidate to be the, the president of Iran. And this relates to what Shirin Abadi called. If there will be a concentrated world attitude toward it, Iran is not as strong as we tend to believe. They are much more vulnerable. They are much more careful of their respect in the world and they, how the world views them, even how the Americans view them. But what can we do? And you have, well, I, I 
had a long session today without mentioning two names of two countries, China, Russia. How you can convince them? Russia is happy that Iran goes nuclear? I don't think so. But maybe the Chinese don't care so much. But uh, the Russians know exactly who is Iran. Both of them, by the way, have problems with small Islamic minorities. The Chinese in July had confronted with student movements uh, or young movement in, in China of Muslims, and they, the Russians sent in Chechnya for a long time. Interestingly, Iran doesn't criticize China or Russia. You know, they can speak about Palestinians all the day, about suppression of Palestinians. But when other Muslims are suppressed by good friends, it's, it's quiet. Look at Iran and Muslims, <coughs> see if you find anything to, on these issues. So it's not only Iran, but also the European, also other countries. At the end of the day, they want to have their own uh, relation, their own interest. And I remember in the uh, American president, Ronald Reagan, uh, announced embargo, economic embargo against Iran in the early 80s, after, during this hostage crisis, uh, or, or after. Uh, I think it was the Canadian government who said, announced that whatever America will not send you, we have can send. So if you have friends like the Europeans and, and others, uh, you, you cannot go that far. Uh, I, I think that today the world is not sufficiently supportive of the United States, and policy towards the United towards Iran cannot be left to the Americans alone. This should be a worldwide effort and what you ask them actually is not much. Is suspend the nuclear program. Respect more human rights. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, in your presentation, you identified three possible solutions for preventing um, um, Iran from going nuclear. One is sort of a world global solution. Um, led by the United States. One is sort of a Middle Eastern regional solution, which sort of establishes peace between Israel and Palestine. And another is sort of an intrastate solution, which is sort of um, um, a grassroots um, level um, sort of revolution within Iran. Um, but one of the things that you strongly sort of discouraged against or, or, or sort of um, um, cautioned against is sort of a, a unilateral um, Israeli move to prevent um, Iran from um, um, going nuclear.